Good evening. Thanks for tuning in to our Bible discussion tonight in the book of Matthew. Uh, we've truly enjoyed these discussions, how Curtis, Nick, and myself were able to sit down and dig into the book of Matthew. Let me encourage you, if you haven't already done so, um, get your Bible out, maybe turn it on on your phone, and, and follow along as we dig into the text. I want to make a couple of kind of updates and announcements, though, before we get into the text. We're going to actually change the scheduling of this class starting on Sunday. We have been putting out this content on Wednesday night, but it, we thought that kind of the, the do something different on Sunday night in lieu of having a second regular sermon, we're going to be doing this discussion class on Sunday night at 6 p.m. So starting this Sunday at 6 p.m., you can tune in online and you can follow along and, and, and into the discussion with your Bible. And then what we're going to do is on Wednesday night, we're going to have a congregational discussion time using the Zoom platform. We'll have instructions for that on our Facebook page on how you can, you know, download the app and log in and everything like that. But plan on, on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, logging in and being able to actually visually see your brothers and sisters. And we're going to discuss what we talked about, um, you know, in this time of Bible study. If you have questions about that, call me, call Nick, call Curtis, call the office here, send us a message. We'll make sure you get plugged in. This might actually be an opportunity even for some of those that weren't able to view these lessons to actually hear them this time too, because not only can you view it through a, you know, the video app on your phone, some people can just call in and hear the lessons too, so we're excited about that. But let, let's get into the text tonight. So we're in the book of Matthew, and one of the things that Nick and Curtis and I keep emphasizing is the purpose of this book is to try to show and prove to the Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Uh, I know Nick has been pointing out, you know, the genealogy of Jesus has, has David and Abraham in it. Uh, we've talked about the, the miracles of Jesus. Uh, I know Curtis emphasized the fact that Jesus is that masterful teacher, um, the fulfillment of prophecy. All these different evidences are proving that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Well, where we left off last week was this big sermon that Jesus preached called the Sermon on the Mount. And um, ultimately, the, the purpose of that sermon, as we've kind of concluded, is probably found in chapter 5 and verse 20. Nick, will you read that for us? Sure. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying that you need to be better than the scribes and the Pharisees, but it's not so much just live holier or, or, or I don't know, it's not just about actions, but what, what is it really about? I, I think in... What we, we touched on last week and we're going to dig into tonight is it's the heart. It's not just the outside appearance. You don't. It's not just being appearing to be uh, pious or appearing to be religious. It's actually living it out uh, in your heart and letting your heart dictate your actions. Going it's forward. not about just completing the rules. It's about it's about doing these actions with everything that you are, which you know uh, Jesus will eventually say that it's the best commandment is to love. You know your the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. And that part of your being, being the, the part of you that completes these commands, not just the action of... Yeah, it's righteous from the inside out. Yes, right. It's not about That's just, you know, it. doing a bunch of different actions and saying, look at me. It's about you genuinely care about other people. You genuinely want to do what's right. You genuinely love God. So you, you know, live righteously. Right. Well, in, in chapter 5, um, in verse 1, Jesus lays out what is known as the Beatitudes or the Blesseds. And he lays out all these different character traits that we should have, traits about being merciful and gentle and pure, being a peacemaker. And then in verses 13 and onward, he kind of talks about how you practically carry out those Beatitudes by being salt, by being light. And then where we kind of looked at last week was starting in verse 21, Jesus starts making some pretty stark contrast between maybe what the people were being taught and versus what he wants them to do. Sure. How do you explain these contrasts? What kind of stood out to you in these? <laughs> I, th I think that, one, we, we see in the text the, the contrast. You have heard, and then but I say. Uh, and so it goes back to, to what um, the Pharisees were, were, were teaching, what the Pharisees were living, and then Jesus is calling them to that, this higher level of righteousness by but I say. And so that's something to see in the text to jump out. Uh, on these six different uh, uh, sections that Jesus is going through. Right, and then at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, like we mentioned before, 729, where he says he spoke as one having authority, and I think that that's what, he's like, look, you've heard what the law said and what the teachers have taught you, but here's here's what I say. And when somebody says that, I mean, really, what what kind of image does that put yeah, into you're your putting, mind? You're putting yourself in a position of authority. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But and, Jesus backs it, right? right. And he can prove it. Yeah. Uh, let's make sure everybody in the audience understands, too, what Jesus is doing is he takes 
these Old Testament commands that weren't false. I mean, he makes a, a statement like, you shall not commit murder, or you shall not commit adultery. Right. But he takes them and says, okay, you're kind of missing the overall gist of what these commands sure. are all about. The command of not murdering was also an emphasis on what? He mentions the anger. Sun. Yeah, it's yeah, about anger. anger. Right. So don't just not kill your brother, but love your brother and don't speak evil of your brother and say insulting things. Yeah. And then he did the same thing about adultery, right? He says, you shall not commit adultery. And what we looked at last week was it's more than just don't cheat on your wife. It's about not lusting, right? Right. It's how a, you value people. I yeah, think absolutely. is all this sermon is about. How do you value the people, especially if we're playing off, you know, what the Beatitudes are saying, of course, the, you know, the descriptions of the people of the citizens of God's kingdom, he's he's now showing you what that looks like and saying that, okay, it's not just, you know, what you see in the Beatitudes. Here's how this is actually played out. Um, when you're angry, how do you respond? How do you treat other people around you? When, you know, you're following the Jewish laws or ordinances that were spoken by these guys who had interpreted the law, how do you respond? Do you respond like they respond or do you respond like God responds? And then that's what um, the scary thing is, is that it's our heart that makes a difference. I mean, we can go back and not murder, but still be angry. And that it causes right. as many issues. We're in as bad of a situation um, as if we were to murder. And the same with, with lust. Um, and, and that's the scary thing. I mean, statistically, uh, it was like 63% of the population struggles with pornography. Um, and 50% of the members in the church do. Uh, it might be members of the church or those in ministerial positions. So statistically, we have people who, who are who are watching this right now who are struggling uh, with with lust, uh, specifically pornography, mm -hmm. and it's something yeah. that we don't uh, we don't address much. But um, Jesus is calling out that behavior. While we may not uh, be be physically uh, cheating on our spouse, just having that that lustful intent to look on someone with lustful desire um, yeah. uh, is equating the same thing in our mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was in a seminar this weekend. Um, down at the Highland, well, it's actually online, the Highland Church in Bakersfield was hosting it. And in a discussion about um, pornography, one of the points that was brought up was one of the best ways to overcome lust in general is empathy for the, the person that maybe is the object of your lust. If you view that person not as just an object for your own pleasure, but as, you know, someone created by God, you know, even Paul would tell Timothy, you know, um, view the younger women as sisters, that kind of idea, that that's a way to overcome that temptation. Because when you don't, when you disconnect yourself from that person, it's easy to view them as an object. But when you connect on an individual level, then you're like, oh, I need to respect this person. And it's kind of the same way with the whole not murdering and don't be angry at your brother. If you actually view the person as your brother, you're not going to be insulting them. You're not going to hurt them and that kind of idea. And, and that's what Jesus finishes up this section, um, talking about that if, you, if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. If your hand causes you to stumble, um, cut it off. Uh, and that's what he, he finishes up. I, would just, I discovered this or realized this uh, this week when preparing for this class, um, that if you jump ahead to chapter 6, um, verse 23, what he, Jesus here says, but if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. And that's, a, that's kind of the, when, when we struggle with anger, when we struggle with lust, it, it, it fills us up to where it displaces Jesus in our heart, essentially, uh, right. and causes us to, to have the this dark mentality. And then in 7, 5, he he does the same thing. You hypocrite first, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And it just goes back to 622, which goes back to what we've been talking about. So that's, I mean, it's all, everything's interconnected. And Jesus is making some statements that to the Jewish people, they've never, they, they've never heard or understood this in the way that they would normally. Well, so. good recap. well let, let's, bring it <laughs> let's, let, let's bring it forward then. So for those following along, and we're going to pick up here in verse 31. So Jesus has just laid out, you know, don't commit adultery, don't commit murder, but it's more than that. It's about valuing the individual. And then he jumps into something that might seem to be off, I mean, maybe off track, but it's not. It fits in. He mentions divorce. He says, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, mm -hmm. there was guidelines in the Old Testament for, you know, for divorce and how that would take place. From my understanding, the certificate of divorce would be almost like a, a protection for the woman that's being put <laughs> away. You can't say that, well, you know, she's not just ran off and trying to be with someone else. This is, there's been a separation there. She is moving on, you know, that kind of thing. It was, there was some legal protection there. So that's why he wanted them to have this certificate, you know. But then he says, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity or fornication or sexual morality, depending on your, your translation here, 
makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, before we get into specifics of this here, let's, let's think about how this might relate to the previous two commands that he's dealing with. He mentioned, don't commit murder, but really it's about not hating your brother or not you know, mm -hmm. insulting them, right. not being angry. Then he mentions, don't commit adultery, but it's deeper than adultery. It's about don't lust. Yeah. Now he says, you know, you've heard it said, give a certificate of divorce, but then I say to you, you know, not to do that and so on. I think ultimately it's about valuing people again still. Yeah, so, and, and I think he, we see that because what, what is the emphasis? The emphasis here is that, that if, if you divorce your wife without uh, the reason for sexual immorality, you make her commit adultery. So the emphasis right. on her in that action. So in, in the event of sexual immorality, um, she has taken it upon herself to become an adulteress. Uh, in this instance, you pushed, are acting her or making her uh, become an adulteress. Yeah. Now, in, in the Jewish culture, I mean, between 200 B.C. and 200 A.D., what you had was a book called the Mishnah and commonly known as, you know, the referred to as the book that people would or Jewish teachers would go to to understand the interpretations of those who had put their writings in yeah, this book. Yeah, it was the teaching of rabbis right. and, the, the and religious and one leaders. Right, and one of the things was when a woman, if you married a woman and she messed up your meal or, if you, or she looked at you the wrong way, a lot of times weddings would be held on Wednesdays because Thursdays was when the court was in session where they could actually take and get you know, a certificate of divorce. So, I mean, divorce here is just as rampant as it is in our in our culture. We and know that God hates divorce to begin with. So, and it's because they didn't care about it. Right. Women they were didn't treated care about like, it. like an object. Right. If it's an object of lust, might as well be an object to just discard if I'm done in marriage. Right. She, she turned 40, so I'm going to trade her in for 220s. <laughs> this is, Curtis has a tendency to get us off track, right? But let's see how he breaks this down. He says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for this reason of, marital and faithfulness. If she's out sleeping with someone else, we understand what you're doing is kind of the point. You know, she's, right, yeah. she's on, not really for yeah, me. She's, she's for somebody yeah, she's, else. She's trying to break this and all that. He says, yeah. but if you divorce her for any other reason besides that, you make her commit adultery. Now that's kind of a strange way of putting it a little bit, but we were kind of talking about this earlier. What, what do you think that means? Yeah. And, and it's, it's that, that act of, of, of um, sex again. Uh, and so in that culture, she was, um, left to either remarry or prostitute herself in order to, to um, maintain her livelihood. She, she yeah. wasn't able to have a, a job the same way that we were. She wasn't able to own property the same way that, that we were. An unmarried woman right. really doesn't have much option, no, no, especially no. if you got married at a young age. So now you get put away or divorced yeah. by a husband. He says, I'm done with you, and which is wrong anyway. And now she's left, okay, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to only be one man, one woman for life in marriage, but right. now I'm single. The, in that society, you would either have to join yourself to a man in marriage and something like that, which that doesn't seem to be the pattern you're supposed to follow here, sure. or go down a path like Curtis said of prostitution, which is obviously wrong too. A dramatic example of this is in Mark chapter 6 with Herodias and Herod. When um, Herod is told by John and he's listening to John about this idea that he's not supposed to be married to his brother's wife, Philip, then she forms some kind of vendetta or grudge against uh, John yeah. and puts his head on a platter because if she, if Herod were to divorce her, she would lose all of her status and probably be thrown out uh, as as a ho as you know homeless and and not have a place you know even even to keep lay her head down. So and, and I think circling back here, the the, the thesis of sure. the Sermon on the Mount is uh, let your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Yeah. Uh, and so the same with um, with murder, the same with lust. Um, here, it's uh, the mentality was that go ahead and get all the divorces you want. Just make sure you give her a certificate at the result. Yeah. And it's not paying attention to to the heart of the matter or the impact on other people. Right? Are you really doing this? Are, are you really practicing this? Practicing this? Taking this upon the inner man and letting you know? I, I know we talked about this before, and I think you mentioned it in uh, one of your uh, two two minute Tuesday talks that. If you work on the inner man, then the outer man. That was man, this morning. That was this morning. <laughs> <laughs> this, and then the inner man, uh, the outer man becomes what the inner man already is. And I think that that's a good way well, to look at Well, you think about if, if this whole sermon is a refutation of the Pharisees, later the yeah. Pharisees would ask them the same question about divorce, basically, in Matthew 19. <laughs> and it seems to be that they wanted a way to kind of just do whatever they wanted and sure. still be considered righteous. And yeah. so do we today. Yeah, yeah, yeah don't we? We're always, yeah. I mean, how many times do I get questions about marriage and divorce and remarriage? Because we want 
or and we want a reason to be able to do whatever we want, justification for our actions. And we're not going to get into every facet of marriage and divorce right. in this class tonight. But ultimately, if we value our spouse, if we love them the way Jesus, you know, loves us, and then treat them right, a lot of this situation will be overcome. The problem was back then, just like now. So many people are only seeking to please themselves and not actually think right. about other people. And maybe it's a sermon too, you know, you could say about, about selfishness. Yeah. You would say, you know, wow, I mean, like if I'm thinking about somebody else before myself, then, I, then I'm not necessarily put in this situation. But like I, we, we talked about last week, everybody's capable of doing, of breaking one of these commands, of doing something wrong. Everybody's capable of it. I mean, if you, okay. you can't say you're not, capable you're a human being they dealt with it here we deal with it today in this world and uh you're not yeah. obsolete yeah, from the problem these, <laughs> these problems are still no, prevalent today just, yeah well let's look at this last thing he says he says and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery and, hmm. and we're again we'll talk about that more when we get to matthew 19 but again you're also kind of setting yourself up for a bad situation too because you know when you just disregard marriage and are marrying and remarrying and all this kind of stuff like that it totally messes up God's plan yeah. for it. Well, then he goes into the next one here in verse 33. And remember, we're following this pattern. You've heard it said, but I say to you. So now he says, again, you have heard um, that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows. You know, you shouldn't lie, but you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. You know, if you make a promise to God, you mm -hmm. need to keep that promise. And we have vows right. today and promises and commitments and all that. So he says, don't make false vows. But then he goes on, he says, but I say to you, make no oath at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now, I don't know all the cultural implications of this, but from my understanding, to support whatever they were saying, they might say something like, I swear by the holy city of Jerusalem. You know, and people yeah. say the same things today. Like, <laughs> I, I swear on my mama's grave, or, you know, I, yeah. I swear on the Bible, or that kind of idea. So I believe that's kind of what was going on here. But Jesus says, don't even do that. Don't make an oath and don't swear by anything. Now that seems kind of odd because I don't know about you, but I've been sworn in and things before in different situations, whether, you know, <laughs> jury duty or something like that, right. or, you know. And even backing up a couple thousand years ago, Paul swears oaths uh, later on. I mean, we see that in Romans. Uh, and so it, it's not. I think the oath itself, it's the way they were doing it. Well, let's allow right. the Bible to teach us well, then what I, he's talking about, right? I, I mean, let's continue to come. here, you shall not make false vows. Like, in other words, you shouldn't say so, you shouldn't vow to do something that you're not going to do. Well, that was the, uh, that's that was, the original that's command. That's the command that they were holding to. And so. then, yeah. And so then they had a tendency to say, I don't lie. I never make a false vow. But they were making <laughs> excessive vows. It's the promise right. with your fingers crossed. Yeah, because let's, let's go right. on and look what he says. You know, he says, nor right. shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. So there's some things you don't have control over, first right. off. So be careful with making random oaths, because if you promise to do something that maybe you can't later fulfill, then you're a liar. And that's a bad thing. <laughs> but then he makes this statement that I think clarifies the entire discussion right here in verse 37. Little Bible study tip. Don't just look at one verse and try to determine what it means. Look at the section that it's in and how it fits. Verse 37, before he goes on to the next point, he says, But let your statement be, yes, yes, or no, no, anything beyond these is evil. So I think the idea here is just say what you mean, mean what you say, and you shouldn't have to make an oath. Yeah, and we're going through this right now with Coulter at home. He's four, and he's found out that my feet are ticklish. Um, just <laughs> heads up, my feet are ticklish. But he will promise that he's not taking my socks off to tickle me. And then he immediately tickles me. And so it's just that, that thing, the boy cried wolf yeah. kind of mentality. <laughs> right. That if you're actually promising something, you need to actually do it or not do it. And that's what I, I think we see here, that that wasn't happening. They were saying that they would do something, and then no, they, they backed out. And I think also Christians shouldn't have to make oaths. Right. Truly righteous people that are godly and holy don't have to bring in a bunch of clarifiers. I, I know me and Nick see this here in the office sometimes. Someone will come by needing help with something. And sometimes people will come and say, hey, I'm short on food. Can you help me out? We're like, cool. Other times they have a giant story that goes with it. You know, well, this happened and this happened and this. And I've kind of found from my own experience when you have to prove yourself yeah. in a whole bunch of words. Usually you're kind of lying, yeah, right. right? And I think back here, if you're an honest 
person who's truthful and, 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 you know, consistent, you don't have to say anything except yes or no, because you know you're a person of your word, a person of integrity. Right. So I think that is, is something that we need to keep in mind. That's Jesus' point. The sure. Pharisees were good about not making false vows, but truthfully, like you said, fingers crossed behind the back, really right. they should just be people who's yes or yes and no or no. It, and if we're righteous, we're going to be that way. Right, and I think he's taking them from tradition to the origin, right? Tr- from from the tradition of the men that are in their time. Again, you know, we go back to the, these are Jewish people. They have very, you know, deep familiarity with, with the scriptures. Like, they know what this command means, but they're using it as face at face value. Yeah. Like, we, like we, I mean, we sometimes do that. We use a verse at face value. We say, well, this verse means this. And, and we try to fulfill the verse, but then... We, you know, we don't really dig into, like you had said, a good Bible study tip, you know, look at the context of what's there and you can find the deeper meaning, the deeper understanding of what's being said instead of just taking, you know, a well, verse at face yeah, value. Yeah, and it's a very legalistic mindset. Sure. It's very juvenile too. My kids sure. do this. Uh, uh, recently <laughs> we said, look, we do not want you on YouTube right now on the computer. Okay, that was the rule. Well, we come downstairs and there's YouTube on the TV. They, we didn't say not on the Apple TV. You know what I mean? <laughs> the gist of the command was don't do this, but right. they look for a legalistic sure. kind of kind of juvenile loophole, that kind of idea. And that's the same right. way the Pharisees were instead just yes, yes, and no, no. So that's yeah. the fourth, I believe, contrast here that he makes of you have heard it said, but I say to you. And now he gives another one in verse 38, and he's just rattling them off here, and I love this. He's showing what it truly means to be a righteous person following these Beatitudes and uh, mm-hmm. you know, the Christian that we should be. So you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, that's for Leviticus 24, I believe, verse 20, something like that. And it's and that was an idea that, you know, kind of you should get a punishment appropriately to what you had, you know, what you were doing and that kind of idea. So Jesus says, for you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. So now, what do you think they were doing then with this Old Testament command? I, I think that the command, the intent behind the command was to um, um, discourage revenge. That, listen, if you do this to your brother and it causes his eye to come out, he's going to do that right back to you. So be careful on what you do. But I think that they were using it literally that, hey, you ran into my car. You put a dent in my car. Well, probably not a car back then. Uh, but you put a dent in, dent, in, dent in my car, my chariot, and now I'm going to do it right back to you. Uh, and it, the, the I think that the... The law was, again, intended to pr- discourage that, that this level was a of la- revenge. This was saying, here's appropriate justice being served versus, you know, anger, vengeance, and that kind of idea. Well, and I think, too, when we also, when you, when you go back to, you know, how, I mean, we're talking about dealings with, with, with in the Jewish community. We're not talking about necessarily dealings within, within you know, with, with the outsiders. Yeah, we're yeah. talking about dealings with, so... In their eyes, like the next command we're going to see is love your neighbor, not to spoil it for everybody. But but in that particular instance, he's talking about like how Curtis is my brother, Cliff is my brother, you know, and then how I treat my brother. So, for instance, the anger part of it, the committing murder, the taking it to law is putting it in perspective here where Jesus is saying, the command is saying an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Okay, well, that means, you know, within the with, with everybody within the Jewish community, I can... Uh, commit revenge, but they're misinterpreting it um, there in verse in verse 38 of this course of well, the teaching. And, and it, again, it's very juvenile in the yeah. whole approach. Again, not to go back to <laughs> children and how they act, but children do the same thing. Why'd you hit your sister? Well, he hit me first. Ooh, you yeah. know, that kind of idea. And it's a very childish way, and the Pharisees have tendency of being very childish in it, whereas we, as we mature as grown-ups, maybe our child might say something mean or hurtful to us. They get in trouble and they go, I hate you. We don't go, I hate you too. That would be a horrible parent. Right. That's immature. <laughs> yeah. But we children act that way. So Jesus says, don't just seek revenge, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Don't even, don't even go after it. It's not, not that big of a deal, right? right? He says, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to other to him also. I don't think he's making a literal thing that if someone actually slaps you, you go, come on, buddy, do the other one too. That might cause more of a fight right, right. here. But I think, what's the point? Don't seek retribution. And right. we're called to a higher level of righteousness. Uh, this one is that when you are, when someone offends you, respond with kindness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what I think we'll see um, here as we finish out this section. When, you know, when I, when I was younger, I was, you know, I'll get bullied sometimes by the neighbor kids and I would fight back, you know, and I would, try to retaliate and my mom would always tell me kill him with kindness kill him with kindness 
kill them with kindness. And that always stuck with me because in my mind, what I wanted when they hurt me was retribution. I wanted to get them back for what they had done. I wanted to make them feel the pain that I felt. Uh, and that's, I think it's human nature. Yeah. Just to, But it's also kind of a, a, a juvenile way. A juvenile, uh, but it's exactly yeah. what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. it's a juvenile way of, of thinking and, and acting. So. Well, also too, I mean, it's, you know, we look back at the Beatitudes here when he talks about blessed are the meek. The idea of being meek from what a best definition I heard was power under restraint. Yeah. So you have a power to seek retribution, but you restrain yeah. that power. Right. I was going to point a, that out too, that it, it goes back to that idea of, absolutely. of five, seven. First well, let, let's go on. He says, summer. he gives some other ways, some illustrations of this now, how it might play out in their society. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. You're not seeking retribution, whatever. <laughs> take it. You know, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. And from my understanding, I believe like the Roman army could actually implore a citizen and say, hey, carry my arm, my armor for this yeah. length of time. And right. maybe as a Jewish person, when you got to that one mile marker, you might drop and say, I'm right. done. Imagine the impact you'd have on your, you know, the people around if you said, Whoa. hey, I'll carry it one more. I got this. Whoa, these people are different. It's you know? good. Yeah. Um, that's right. They had, Ro they had literal like Roman mile markers on the roads. Like, okay, you know, it's like, you have to take my pack a mile. Now I'm going to do it too. So you go above and beyond you don't seek retribution. In fact, you're such a nice person. Verse 42, <laughs> give to him who asks from you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. And again, don't I, I mean, I'm sure we always have a tendency to grab it. Or were you saying we should be a pushover and be taken advantage of? We should be generous, kind people who care more about the other person than ourselves. And that's who we are as righteous people. Sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. later on, we, we see that be as was as kind as does, but as shoot as serpents. I yeah. mean, it's not to be a complete pushover, but uh, again, what, what Jesus is getting at here is that we do not respond in kind. The, the, what we get, we're not going to dish back. We want right. the, the reputation of friendliness in all that we do. Uh, I remember one time we had some visitors come to the church here, and, and I, I called them up, I think it was on a Monday, trying to you know, get some contact with them and set up a Bible study. And the one thing they said, they said, we just love how nice everybody was. And that's the rep that we want to have. We right. want to be nice people. Even the people that don't believe in Jesus, that don't even want to follow God, should be able to look at us and go, you know what? Those Christians are good people. Yeah. And that's the kind of reputation we want. Right. Pharisees didn't always have that reputation. Oh, they looked holy, but they weren't nice people. And, yeah. and that is that is the, the hard challenge of being a Christian, is to, to model your heart after Christ. I mean, we wear the name Christian, we wear the name Christ, and we need to model that behavior. And it's... I don't know about you guys, but for me, a lot of times it's easier said than done, especially oh, yeah. with this with this attitude. I mean, you kind of have a, a a level of resentment at times um, that I don't need to be doing that, or I'm better than that, yeah. or, or this, that, or the other. Um, when here we need to, to humble ourselves to be that. Well, show and that's that what before it'd be salt, be light. Yeah, it's the same idea. Right, and you had seen. I mean, like you know, when when you were growing up, when I was growing up, we we saw a, be, a certain for particular behavior. And we thought that that's how we should act towards something. Like I didn't grow up in church. So my view or my my thought process of good behavior was when someone didn't go crazy and do crazy things. Now, your view of behavior might be different. Their view of behavior, their view of seeing the behavior was don't commit the act, right? Don't commit the worst possible act. But now Jesus is saying, here's how you should really act. Here's the behavior that you should model because this is a behavior that models God. Yeah. And, and he's going to hit it hard in chapter 7, but yeah. the, the fruit, right. uh, it shows what the root is. And so yeah. our, our fruit um, shows what our heart is. Uh, right. And that's what, if, if our heart is in the right spot, we will go two miles. We will turn the other cheek. We will sure. give without a concern on it coming back. Well, then look at what the next, the last contrast he gives, and I think <laughs> summarizes up all these ones we've been looking at. Verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, we'll talk about the contrast here, but the last one he mentions is love your neighbor. And I think all of these fall under that category. The divorce right. question, the adultery question, the oath question, the vengeance oh, yeah. question are all about whether or not you love your neighbor. So then he says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, and that is true. But then there's this little phrase that's thrown in there. It says, and hate your enemy. Now, I don't remember a command in the Old Testament that ever said, hate your enemy. Yeah, the, the love your neighbor was that Leviticus 19.8, right. yeah. but that hate your enemy, that was added on to the end. And right. if you're following along in your Bible, you might notice that that part isn't in quotations or it's not in italics or something like that because that you and hate your enemy was what they added. 
the Pharisees would add. Right. Love your neighbor. Well, if you're going to love your neighbor, that means you hate your enemy. Right. No, does God, God loves all people. <laughs> we should love all people. There's not a preface there. Well, only love the people that love you back. So he okay. says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, but that's totally wrong. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies. So the general the rule for Christians is love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So even those that want to hurt you, like back in chapter 5, verse 13, that are going to persecute you for righteousness' sake, pray for those people even. Well, look back at verse 19. I mean, he, he's talking about, you know, I mean, you talk about the epitome of adding a command or adding a, a text. When you look at verse 19, he says, Whoever knows one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever teaches them, uh, whoever keeps them shall be called the great in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, when you add a little so, bit on to God's yeah. command. And that's just, I mean, three, four words. Like, yeah. you know, I, and, and... Well, and as you spoke <laughs> Sunday night on biblical authority, you know, here's people disregarding the authority of God right. and adding in their own little twist on it that is completely setting up a false idea of what it means to be sure. a believer. And right. now it's nothing about that command was about hate your enemy, but they made it into that. So he says, don't be like that. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Great way to you know overcome stress when you're being persecuted, of course. I mean, how do you love your enemies? I think maybe is the question we should be having. What does that look like in practice for a Christian today? Well, let, let's look at what he it's, says here, because I think he explains it. And the start off here was prayer. And pray for them by name. Well, and then look what he, let's look at this and we'll back up. He says, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So we have to love mm -hmm. our enemies if we want to be considered sons of God. Right. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is fair and just in loving toward all people. He treats all people equally. Mm -hmm. Verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same thing. Even people that are the low down, dirtiest people are nice to their friends. Okay, yeah. <laughs> He says, if you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I think he's explaining what it means here to love your, your enemy. It means right. to treat your enemy the same way you would treat a friend because that's what God does. And then he sums it up there in verse 48. Therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I know people grab that and run with it and say, well, I could never be perfect. No, no, no. He's talking about God is fair. God yeah. treats all people equally. He sends rain on good people and bad people. And if we're going to say we're children of God, we got to treat the enemies the same way that we treat our friends. And, and their concept of, you know, like we would see um, from, you know, later in different books like James, that their concept of this was, well, if you do evil, evil is returned to you. If you do good, good is returned to you. Yeah. And so their concept is, well, if you're unrighteous, then you don't get rain. If you're righteous, then you get rain. If, you, if you're doing something righteous, then you must be doing yeah, so you, you, something you would judge God, somebody. If something bad yeah. happens to you, you must be a bad person. Right. And so he's saying, look, you know, um, God doesn't show any partiality to anybody. You know, he's, he's not for or against the same people that you're for or against. God loves everybody. You need to love yeah. everybody. Well, yep. and, and then, too, if you take this to the extreme, that this viewpoint that the Pharisees maybe had was, if you feel that you should only love those who love you back, hmm. you might yourself <laughs> only love people to get something in return. Right. Everything you do is about exploiting somebody and using somebody. And sure. really throughout the Bible, when it talks about false teachers, they're usually those that take advantage of other people. Right. If the only reason you're acting kind to somebody is to get something, that's not what it means to be a true child of God. Yeah. Jesus didn't get anything in return when he died on the cross for us. Yeah. And if we're going to embody his love and loving our neighbor, we're going to be fair and consistent and just, just like God. And it's interesting, the title that, that we can be given if we do this is Sons, sons, of, sons of the Father, which goes back to 5.9, right. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yep. And so it's that overall mentality. So, so they should be called Sons of God. And what are some ways you think that we have a tendency to maybe violate this command here? Oh, it's verse 47. Uh, I think that we, we where, where it says, and if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. We, uh, I love our church family. I love our extended church family. But oftentimes we're only focused on each other, each other within the brotherhood. Uh, and we, we miss out on, on the others. So he, in that instance, we're doing what the Gentiles do by only saying hi to you because I, I happen to sit in the same building as you. Absolutely. Yeah. We exclude others. Yeah. And, and to, you know, I always think of it this way, you know, it's like 
like in, in some cases, you know, we might only associate with people who have the same thought, theological thinking as we do, or the same beliefs about one thing or another that we do. And if you don't think the way that we think, then, you know, we, we don't associate with those people sometimes. It's not all the time, but at the same time, you know, he's saying if, if you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? You're, you're not doing anything different. You're not being any better. You're not showing uh, how uh, to love people who are hard to love or yeah. people who've done something against you or done something difficult. We're supposed um, to be different from the sure, world. So yeah. that means that if a, whatever sin it is, whatever sin causes us to cringe the most, right. that person engaging in that sin, we still love them the same way yeah, we love, you absolutely. know, brother, sister, so-and-so at church on Sunday. That's hard to do. It is. It's hard. There's certain things that make us uncomfortable. There's certain things that get our blood boiling and anger. Yeah. There's certain things that, that stress absolutely. us out and worry us. And, and there's some people that are harder to love than other people. But ultimately, if we aren't like God in how we treat people, we can't be called sons of God. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what we should do is probably not go on to chapter 6 then tonight, because I think this context kind of takes a change here. But uh, for those of you that are following along at, at home, read ahead into chapter 6 for our discussion you know, next, next week. But anything you guys want to kind of bring out that stood out to you and what we looked at here in verses um, 31 through 48 here of chapter 5. Just to, to reiterate, going all the way back to all these these six, starting going back to 521, um, that we're called to raise our righteousness. So we we're called to control our anger so we don't have to worry about murder. We're called to control our emotions. We're called to control our lust. Um, we're called to, to say what you mean and, and do what you say. We're called to re reply with oppression with kindness where and here we're called to love like god loves which is that perfect love absolutely and completing the command doesn't require self-control from people just saying well i'm gonna i can do all these other things but not this one thing doesn't require us to have self-control what jesus is doing is saying you gotta have some self-control when you get angry with somebody how are you gonna treat them how are you gonna value that person how are you gonna um how are you gonna respond and i think the, the response is the key because sometimes we overreact or we respond in an ungodly manner or we think in an ungodly way. Uh, and Jesus, I, I agree with you totally. He's calling for self-control. Self-control. And really, if I were to summarize up this entire section of contrast where he goes through <laughs> this, you know, you've heard it said, but I say to you, I think it's all about loving your neighbor. And if we make that the command we're trying to follow, the question about anger solves itself. The question right. about lust solves itself. The question about going to extra mile or divorce, that kind of remedies itself when we treat people the way that God will want us to treat them. Right. So I thank everybody for um, you know tuning in tonight and following along in this time of Bible study. Let me remind you what we're going to be doing is starting on Sunday, this coming Sunday at 6 p.m. We're going to have um, our, our next Bible class session, so you can log in then and follow along. And then on Wednesday night, we're going to have our Zoom you know, discussion where we as a congregation can share and some ideas of what we saw in the text. We'll have information about it in the Facebook members group, and we'll get the information out there so that everybody else can participate. I thank you for tuning in. Keep studying your Bibles.